from Heart Failure, a book I wrote about my time in medical school. I am all gloved up, fifth in line. At Tufts School of Medicine, medical students, particularly male students, practice pelvic exams on anesthetized women without their consent and without their knowledge. Women come in for surgery, and once they're asleep, we all gather around, line forms to the left. We learn more than examination skills. Taking advantage of the woman's vulnerability as she lay naked on a table unconscious, we learn that patients are tools to exploit for our education. Using female patients to teach pelvic exams without their knowledge or consent remains a dirty little secret about medical schools. It's an age-old practice that continues to this day in medical schools around the world. It's been referred to as the vending machine model of pelvic exams, in which students line up to take their turn. Only it's not a vending machine, it's a woman's vagina. It's been called an outrageous assault upon the dignity and autonomy of the patient. The practice shows a lack of respect of these patients as persons, revealing a moral insensitivity and a misuse of power. It is yet another example of the way in which physicians abuse their power and have shown themselves unwilling to police themselves in matters of ethics, especially with regard to female patients. I don't think any of us even think about it, said the director of resident and medical student education at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. It's just so standard as to how you train medical students. When this practice came to light in New Zealand, the chair of the medical association got on television and said, until recently it wasn't an issue. I'm very sorry that women feel they've been assaulted and violated in this way. That, that was never our intention. He had no idea then, asked the reporter, that women might object. All I can say is there's been no objections. Uh, could the reason be, asked the interviewer, that it's very hard for an anesthetized woman to know what's going on? Many hospitals and medical schools have publicly defended the practice, contending this touching is entirely appropriate and clearly falls well within the patient's implied consent to carry out the operation. After all, patients are aware they're entering a teaching hospital, and therefore know that trainees will be actively participating in their care. Though researchers have found that many patients don't no, they are in a teaching hospital, or that medical students are involved in their care because of the deliberate lies and deception. A survey of medical students found that 100% of them had been introduced to patients as doctor. As they go through training, there's an erosion in medical students' attitudes about telling patients they are students. As the students go through their medical training, their sense of responsibility to inform patients that they are just students is found to decrease, especially if the opportunity exists to perform an invasive procedure. That may be why medical students seem to develop this don't-ask-don't-tell policy when it comes to seeking consent for pelvic examinations on anesthetized patients. More than a third of 1,600 medical students surveyed across the country strongly disagreed with the statement hospitals should obtain explicit permission for student involvement in pelvic exams. After all, doctors argue, performing a pelvic exam is no more intimate than placing one's hands inside a surgical incision. Sticking your fingers in a woman's vagina is no more intimate than an ophthalmologist looking into the back of your eye. And any claim to the contrary is just another attempt to justify the obsession with political correctness. Personally, said one medical school professor, I would prefer to see a new generation of well-trained doctors rather than a nation of women whose vaginas are protected from battery by medical students. The national survey concluded, patients admitted to teaching hospitals do not, by the mere act of admission, relinquish their rights as human beings. Is it possible women just don't care? Studies show that up to 100% of women asked said they would want to know that vaginal examinations were being done by medical students. OK, since patients care deeply about being asked, why can't we at least ask their permission? We can't ask women, medical school faculty replied. If we do, they might say no. 
Recent reports of medical students performing pelvic exams for training purposes on anesthetized women without their consent or knowledge have produced a firestorm of controversy and calls for greater regulation. But those so-called recent reports were like 20 years ago. Uh, California was the first state to make it illegal, but these early gains quickly petered out. This practice, common since the late 1800s, was largely unchallenged until a 2003 study reported that 90% of medical students at four Philadelphia-area medical schools performed pelvic exams on anesthetized women for educational purposes, though a subsequent study found the percentage to be less than that. The bottom line, pelvic exams on anesthetized women without consent still happening. How can this continue decade after decade? When medical ethicists have called such practices immoral and indefensible, a practice that should come to an abrupt and immediate halt. Some schools vowed they'd end the practice, but unfortunately these early victories quickly stalled. At the same time some schools were revamping their policies, others were digging in and publicly defending the practice. As medical educators, the Association of Professors of Gynecology and Obstetrics wrote, we must balance a women's freedom to decide with our obligation to develop the next generation of physicians. Some especially blunt teaching faculty contend that patients without health insurance owe it to society to participate since they receive taxpayer-subsidized care. Regulations to curb this practice are said to be placing inappropriate and unnecessary barriers in the way of medical students who need to learn fundamental medical skills and must therefore be resisted. And so, no surprise, med students still do pelvic exams on women under anesthesia. Now, professional medical societies have at least given lip service to the concept of asking for explicit consent, but despite these recommendations, evidence suggests that the practice is alive and well. And the unauthorized use of women is not a localized phenomenon confined to a few bad apple medical schools, but an international problem. Even after Me Too, even after Larry Nasser, the infamous USA gymnastics doctor, was sentenced to like a century in prison, and for what? Touching women's genitalia without their consent. Yet there are still women who are being used as teaching subjects for these exams without their permission, without their consent. A 2020 update from Yale's Center for Bioethics was entitled, A Pot Ignored Boils On. Over the last 30 years, several parties, both inside and outside of medicine, have increasingly voiced opposition, yet such arguments have not compelled meaningful institutional change. Yes, there is the lip service from the medical associations recommending bans on unconsented pelvic exams. However, these statements are advisory and incomplete. They simply do not have the capacity to compel systemic change, as evidenced by institutions in action. In response to the medical profession's inability to police itself, nine states have passed legislation restricting the practice. So if you live in Iowa, Illinois, Utah, Oregon, Maryland, Virginia, New York, California, or Hawaii, there are at least laws on the books to prevent this. But of course, I mean, if you're anesthetized, how would you even know if medical students are lining up or not? Patients are in the worst position to know what's occurring as they are unconscious, and can be used in ways that leave no physical signs, and exams are often undocumented in their medical records. So when the media loses interest, as it has decade after decade, what incentive is there for teaching faculty or hospitals to voluntarily change? Maybe when physicians start being threatened with lawsuits, they'll start obtaining informed consent. As one commentator wrote, hospital administrators who allow medical students in their facilities to perform pelvic exams on unconsenting anesthetized women ought to consult with their legal counsel concerning the definition of rape in their jurisdiction. The solution is simple. Just ask. Ask women for permission. It's their body, their choice. But recent experience has shown that meaningful and complete hospital-by-hospital -hospital change is unlikely to come until some hospital or doctor pays a substantial award in some lawsuit for this error in ethical judgment. Hopefully, that day is coming soon, 
lest that ignored pot finally boils over. Some defend it as harmless, and say asking for consent would make it more likely that patients would say no, denying students a crucial part of their training. When I first wrote about this practice more than 20 years ago in my book Heart Failure, about my time in medical school, I talked about how I had gotten the same comments from my classmates, the, well, then how are we going to learn response. To even present such a question, I feel, is to lose a bit of one's humanity. The answer, of course, is we should learn with women who give their consent. And to do that, God forbid, we might actually have to first establish a relationship with a patient, a trust, talk to them even. We may have to treat them like human beings. In my video, Benefits of Black Human for Weight Loss, a total of 17 randomized controlled trials showed that the simple spice could reduce cholesterol and triglycerides. And the side effects? A weight loss effect. Saffron is another spice found to be effective for treating a major cause of suffering, uh, depression in this case, with a side effect of decreased appetite. When put to the test in a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, saffron indeed was found to lead to a significant weight loss, of 5 pounds more than placebo and an extra inch off the waist in 8 weeks. The dose of saffron used in the study was the equivalent of drinking a cup of tea made from a large pinch of saffron threads. Suspecting the active ingredient might be crocin, the pigment in saffron that accounts for its crimson color, researchers also tried giving people just the purified pigment. That led to weight loss too, but it didn't do as well as the full saffron extract, being the placebo by only 2 pounds and half an inch. The mechanism appeared to be appetite suppression, as the crocin group ended up averaging about 80 fewer calories a day, whereas the full saffron group consumed 170 calories less a day on average. A similar study looked specifically at snacking frequency. The researchers thought perhaps the mood-boosting effects of saffron might cut down on stress-related eating. Indeed, eight weeks of a saffron extract did cut snack intake in half compared to placebo, accompanied by a slight but statistically significant weight loss, about 2 pounds. Even a loss of a few pounds is pretty remarkable given the tiny doses utilized, about 100 mg, which is equivalent to about uh, an eighth of a teaspoon of the spice. The problem is that saffron is the most expensive spice in the world. It's composed of delicate threads sticking up out of the saffron crocus flower. Each flower produces only a few threads, so you'd need 50,000 flowers to make a single pound of spice, enough flowers to cover a football field. So that pinch of saffron could cost a dollar a day. That's why I make 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss and how not to diet. Instead of saffron, I include black cumin, which at a quarter teaspoon a day would only cost 3 cents a day. What about just regular cumin? Used in cuisines around the world from Tex-Mex to South Asian, cumin is the second most popular spice on earth after black pepper. It's one of the oldest cultivated plants with a range of purported medicinal uses, but only recently has it been put to the test for weight loss. Those randomized to a half teaspoon of both lunch and dinner over three months lost about four more pounds and an extra inch off their waist. The spice was found comparable to the obesity drug known as Orlistat. Uh, for those of you who don't remember, that's the anal leakage drug you may have heard about sold under the brand names Ally and Xenical, uh, though the drug company apparently prefers the term fecal spotting to describe the rectal discharge it causes. The drug company's website offered some helpful tips, though. It's probably a smart idea to wear dark pants and bring a change of clothes with you to work. You know, just in case their drug causes you to Crap your pants at work. I think I'll stick with the cumin. Thank you very much. Parkinson's disease is an ever-worsening neurodegenerative disorder that results in death and affects about 1 in 50 of us when we get older. A small minority of cases are genetic and run in families, but 85 to 90% of cases are sporadic, meaning they just seemingly pop up out of nowhere. It's caused by the death of a certain kind of nerve cell in the brain. Once about 70% of them are gone, the symptoms start. OK, so what kills off those cells? 
It's still not completely clear, but the abnormal clumping of a protein called alpha-synuclein is thought to be involved. Why? Because if you inject blended Parkinson's brains into the heads of rats or monkeys, you can induce Parkinson's pathology and symptoms, or even just injecting the pure clumped alpha-synuclein strands themselves. OK, but how do these clumps naturally end up in the brain? It all seems to start in the gut. The part of the brain where the pathology often first shows up is directly connected to the gut, and we have direct evidence of the spread of Parkinson's pathology from the gastrointestinal tract to the brain. Alpha synuclein from brains of Parkinson's patients taken up in the gut wall and creeping up the vagal nerves from the gut into the brain, but this was in rats. If only we had a way to go back and look at people's colons before they got Parkinson's. And indeed, we can. Old colon biopsies were dredged up from people who would later develop Parkinson's, and years before symptoms arose, you could see the alpha synuclein in their gut. Research supported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation has found that you can reliably distinguish the colons of patients from controls by the presence of the Parkinson's protein lodged in the gut wall. But how did it get there in the first place? Perhaps vertebrate food products as a potential source of prion-like alpha-synuclein. Uh, see, nearly all the animals with backbones that we eat— cows, chickens, pigs, and fish— express the protein alpha-synuclein. And so when we eat common meat products, when we eat skeletal muscle, we're eating nerves, blood cells, and the muscle cells themselves. Every pound of meat has like a teaspoon to a tablespoon of blood in it, and that alone could be an alpha-synuclein source to potentially trigger a clumping cascade of our own alpha-synuclein in the gut. Though it may seem intuitive that dietary alpha-synuclein could seed this kind of buildup in our gut, what evidence do we have that it's actually happening? These are pretty interesting data. There's a surgical procedure called a vagotomy, in which the big nerve that goes from your gut to your brain is cut as an old-timey treatment for stomach ulcers. Would cutting communication between the gut and the brain reduce Parkinson's risk? Apparently so, suggesting that the gut-to-brain vagal nerve may be critically involved in the development of Parkinson's disease. Now, of course, many people regularly consume meat and dairy products, but only a small fraction of the general population will develop Parkinson's. So there must be other factors at play that may somehow provide an opportunity for unwanted dietary alpha-synuclein to enter the host and initiate disease. Uh, for example, your gut becomes leakier as you age, so might that play a role? Well, what else makes your gut leaky? Dietary fiber deprivation has also been shown to degrade the intestinal barrier and enhance pathogen entry. So this all raises possibilities for food-based therapies. Parkinson's patients have significantly less Prevotella in their gut, a friendly fiber-eating flora that bolsters your intestinal barrier function. So low levels of Prevotella is linked to a leaky gut, which has been linked to intestinal alpha-synuclein deposition. But fiber-rich foods may bring Prevotella levels back up. Therefore, by adopting a plant-based diet, in addition to getting the beneficial effects of phytonutrients, it's possible that increasing overall fiber intake may modify the gut microbiome and gut leakiness in beneficial ways. So does a vegan diet, one with lots of fiber, no meat, reduce risk for Parkinson's disease? And Parkinson's does appear to be rare in quasi-vegan cultures. Rates are about five times lower in rural sub-Saharan Africa, for instance. And now all this time we were thinking the benefits seen for Parkinson's from plant-based diets was due to the antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nature of the animal-free diets, but maybe it's also due to the increased intestinal exposure to fiber and decreased intestinal exposure to ingested nerves, muscles, and blood. Irritable bowel syndrome is a chronic gastrointestinal disorder that affects about 1 in 10. You may have heard about those low FODMAP diets, but they don't appear to work any better than the standard advice to avoid things like coffee and spicy and fatty foods. In fact, you can hardly tell which is which. 
but most IBS patients do seem to react to specific foods, such as wheat, dairy, soy sauce, or eggs. Though when you test them for typical food allergies, they may come up negative on the skin prick test. But what you want to know is not what happens on their skin, but inside their gut when you eat them. Enter confocal laser endomicroscopy. How cool is this? You can sneak a microscope down someone's throat into their gut and drip on some foods and watch in real time as the gut wall becomes inflamed and leaky. You can actually see the cracks forming within minutes, but it had never been tested in a large group of IBS patients until now. Using this new technology, researchers found that more than half of IBS sufferers have this kind of reaction to various foods, what they call an atypical food allergy that flies under the radar of traditional allergy tests. Exclude those foods from the diet, and you get a significant alleviation of symptoms. But outside of a research setting, uh, there's no way to know which foods are the culprit without trying your own exclusion diet. And there's no greater exclusion diet than excluding everything. A 25-year-old woman had complained of abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea for a year, and drugs didn't seem to help. But after fasting for 10 days, her symptoms improved considerably and appeared to stay that way at least 18 months later. And it wasn't just subjective improvement. They took biopsies that showed the inflammation go down, directly measured her bowel irritability, and stuck expanding balloons and electrodes in her rectum to actually measure changes in her sensitivity to pressure and electrical stimulation. Fasting seemed to kind of reboot her gut. Uh, but just because it worked for her doesn't mean it works for others. Case reports are most useful when they inspire researchers to put it to the test. Despite research efforts, medical treatment for this condition is still unsatisfactory. I mean, we can try to suppress the symptoms with drugs, but what do you do when even that doesn't work? 84 IBS patients, 58 of whom who failed basic treatment, uh, which consisted of pharmacotherapy and brief psychotherapy, 36 of the 58 who were still suffering underwent 10 days of fasting, whereas the other 22 stuck with the basic treatment. And those in the fasting group experienced significant improvements in abdominal pain, diarrhea, loss of appetite, nausea, anxiety, and interference with life in general, which was significantly better than the control group. The researchers concluded that fasting therapy could be useful for treating moderate to severe patients with IBS. Unfortunately, patient allocation was neither blinded nor randomized, so the comparison to the control group doesn't mean much. Uh, they were also given IV vitamins, uh, B1 and vitamin C, which seems typical of these Japanese fasting trials, even though one wouldn't expect to get vitamin deficiency syndromes, beriberi or scurvy, to present within just you know, 10 days of fasting. And they were also kept isolated, and maybe that made the psychotherapy work better. It's hard to tease out just the fasting effects. Uh, psychotherapy alone can provide lasting benefits. 101 outpatients with irritable bowel syndrome were randomized to medical treatment or medical treatment with three months of psychotherapy. After three months, the psychotherapy group did better, and the difference was even more pronounced a year later, a year after the psychotherapy ended. Better at three months, and even better at 15 months. Right? Psychological approaches appear to work about as well as antidepressant drugs for IBS, but the placebo response for IBS is on the order of 40%. And that's whether we're talking about psychological interventions or drugs or alternative medicine approaches. So essentially nothing, a sugar pill, improves symptoms 40% of the time. So I figure one might as well choose a therapy first that's you know, cheap, safe, simple, and side effect free, which extended fasting is most certainly not. But if all else fails, it may be worth exploring under close physician supervision. An uncontrolled and unpublished study purported to show a beneficial effect of fasting on migraine headaches, but you know, fasting may be more likely to trigger a migraine than help it. In fact, skip meals are among one of the most consistently identified dietary triggers of headaches in general. In a review of hundreds of fasts at the True North Health Center in California, the incidence of headaches was nearly one in three. But you know, True North also published a remarkable case report on post-traumatic headache. Uh, the CDC estimates that more than a million Americans sustain traumatic brain injuries every year, and chronic pain is a common complication, as in like three-quarters suffering such an injury. There are drugs, of course, to treat it. There are 
always drugs, and if that doesn't work, surgery, cutting the nerves to your head to stop the pain. Well, what about fasting and plans? A highly debilitating condition difficult to manage, a 52-year-old woman presents with unremitting chronic post-traumatic headache. And when I say chronic, I mean chronic pain for 16 years, but who then achieved long-term relief following fasting, followed by an exclusively plant-based diet free of added sugar, oil, or salt. Before then, she had tried drug after drug after drug after drug after drug with no relief, suffering in constant pain. Her entire life started out in constant pain, but then, after the fast, the intensity of her pain was cut in half, and though she was still having daily headaches, at least there were some pain-free periods. Six months later, she tried it again, and eventually her headaches were mild, under 10 minutes and infrequent, and she continued that way months and even years later. Now, of course, it's hard to disentangle the effects of the fasting from the effects of the whole food plant-based diet she remained on those ensuing years. You've heard of analgesics, painkillers? Well, there are some foods that may be proalgesic, pain-promoting, such as foods high in arachidonic acid, which includes meats, dairy, and eggs. So the lowering of arachidonic acid, from which our body makes a range of pro-inflammatory compounds, may be accomplished by eating a more plant-based diet. So maybe that contributed to the benefit in the fasting case, uh, whereas many plant foods are high in anti-inflammatory components. So in terms of migraine headaches, more plant foods and less animal foods may help, but you don't know until you put it to the test. The researchers figured a plant-based diet may offer the best of both worlds, so they designed a randomized controlled crossover study where those with recurrent migraines were randomized to eat a strictly plant-based diet or to take a placebo pill. And then the groups switched. Uh, during the placebo phase, half said the pain got better, half said the pain remained the same or got worse, but during the dietary portion, they almost all got better. Uh, during that first block, the diet group experienced significant improvements in headache number, pain intensity, days with headaches, and a reduction in the amount of painkillers they needed to take. In fact, it worked a little too good. Many individuals were unwilling to complete the study by returning to their previous diets. Uh, remember, they were supposed to go back to the regular diets and take a pill instead, but they felt so much better that they were like, no way, Jose. And we've seen this with other trials, where those trying plant-based diets felt so good, uh, they often refused to abandon them, screwing up the study. So uh, plant-based diets can sometimes work a little too well. Consistent evidence from a variety of sources unequivocally establishes that bad LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Strokes and heart attacks are a leading cause of death. This evidence base includes hundreds of studies involving millions of people. Cholesterol is the cause of atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, and the message is loud and clear. It's the cholesterol, stupid noted the editor of the American Journal of Cardiology, William Clifford Roberts, whose CV is more than 100 pages long, having published about 1,700 articles in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Yes, there are at least 10 traditional risk factors for atherosclerosis, but, as Dr. Roberts noted, only one is required for the progression of the disease, elevated cholesterol. Phew! You say, because you just got back from your doctors and your cholesterol is normal. Thank goodness. But wait, having a normal cholesterol in a society where it's normal to drop dead of a heart attack isn't necessarily a good thing. With heart disease the number one killer of men and women, we definitely don't want to have normal cholesterol levels. We want to have optimal levels, and not optimal by current laboratory standards, but optimal for human health. Normal LDL cholesterol levels are associated with the hidden buildup of atherosclerotic plaques in our arteries, even in those with so-called optimal risk factors by current standards. Blood pressure under 120 over 80, normal blood sugars, total cholesterol under 200. If you went to your doctor with those kinds of numbers, you'd get a gold star and a lollipop. But if your doctor used ultrasound and CT scans to actually peek inside your body, overt atherosclerotic plaques would be detected in 38% of people with those kinds of quote-unquote optimal numbers. Maybe those ain't so optimal after all. 
maybe we should define an LDL cholesterol level as optimal only when it no longer causes disease. What a concept! When more than 1,000 men and women in their 40s were scanned, having an LDL level under 130, which most lab tests would consider a normal LDL, left them with atherosclerosis throughout their body. Atherosclerotic plaques were not found only with LDL down around 50 or 60, which just so happens to be the level most people had before we all started eating this way. The majority of the adult population in the world had LDLs of about 50, so that's the true normal. Present average values should not be regarded as normal. We don't want to have a normal cholesterol based on a sick society. We want a cholesterol normal for the human species, which may be down around 30 to 70, which for those who live outside of the U.S. is an LDL of 0.8 to 1.8 millimoles per liter. Although an LDL level of 50 to 70 seems excessively low by modern American standards, it is precisely the normal range for individuals living the lifestyle and eating the diet for which we were genetically adapted over millions of years, a diet centered around whole plant foods. No wonder we have this killer epidemic of atherosclerosis, given the LDL level our bodies were designed for is less than half of what we presently consider normal there's an inappropriate tendency in medicine to accept small changes in risk factors. But the goal is not to just decrease risk, but to prevent plaques, period. So how low should you go? In light of the latest evidence from trials exploring the benefits and risk of profound LDL cholesterol lowering, the answer to the question, how low do you go, is arguably a straightforward, as low as you can. Uh, but yeah, indeed, lower may be better. However, if you're going to do it with drugs, then you have to balance that with the risk of drug side effects. The reason we don't just drug everyone with statins, like putting in the water supply, is that although it would be great if everyone's cholesterol was lower, there are the countervailing risks of the drugs. So doctors aim to use statin drugs at the highest dose possible, achieving the largest LDL cholesterol reduction possible, without increasing risk of the muscle damage the drugs may cause. But when you're using lifestyle changes to bring down your cholesterol, all you get are the benefits, but can you get it low enough with diet alone? Ask some of the country's top cholesterol experts what they shoot for, and odds are you'll hear something like an LDL under 70 or so. Yeah, we should try to avoid the saturated and trans fats found in junk foods and meat, and the dietary cholesterol found mostly in eggs, but it is unlikely anyone can achieve an LDL cholesterol of 70 with a low saturated fat, low cholesterol diet alone. Many doctors have this mistaken impression. An LDL of 70 isn't only possible on a healthy enough diet, it may be normal. Those eating strictly plant-based diets can average an LDL that low. No wonder plant-based diets are the only dietary patterns ever proven to reverse coronary heart disease in the majority of patients. And the side effects? You get to feel better, too. Several randomized clinical trials have demonstrated that more plant-based dietary patterns significantly improved psychological well-being and quality of life, less depression, less anxiety, better emotional well-being, better physical well-being, and better general health. More than 2,000 years ago, Hippocrates declared, let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. Except he really didn't. It doesn't appear that he ever actually said those words. Now, there's no doubt about the relevance of food in health and disease in his writings, but who really cares? That was 2,000 years ago, when disease was thought to arise from a bad sense of humors. Now we have science, and there's an overwhelming body of evidence illustrating the dramatic impact of a healthy lifestyle on reducing all-cause mortality, meaning death from all causes put together, and preventing chronic diseases such as coronary heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. But wait, don't these diseases just run in your family? Uh, what if you just have bad genes? According to the esteemed former chair of nutrition at Harvard, for most diseases contributing importantly to mortality in Western populations, we've long known that non-genetic factors often account for at least 80 to 90 percent of risk. We know this because rates of the leading killers like cardiovascular disease and major cancers vary up to a hundredfold around the world. And when people migrate from low to high-risk countries, their disease rates almost always change to that of the new environment. 
Currently, for example, we've been able to identify modifiable behavioral factors, including specific aspects of diet, overweight, inactivity, and smoking, that account for more than 70% of your risk of having a stroke or getting colon cancer, more than 80% of coronary heart disease risk, and more than 90% of risk for type 2 diabetes. All of that disease can be prevented by our own actions. If most of the power is in our own hands, why do we allocate massively more resources to treatment than prevention? And even preventive strategies are heavily biased towards pharmacology rather than supporting improvements in diet and lifestyle that could be more cost-effective. For example, treating high cholesterol with statin drugs could cost tens of billions a year, only to have a modest impact on the incidence of heart disease. The inherent problem is that most pharmacologic strategies don't address the underlying causes of disease, which are not drug deficiencies. Ironically, the chronic diseases that are most amenable to lifestyle treatment are the same ones most profitably treated by drugs, because if you don't change your diet, you have to pop the pills every day for the rest of your life. So the cash cow drugs are the drugs we need the least even though the most widely accepted, well-established chronic disease practice guidelines uniformly call for lifestyle change as the first line of therapy, physicians often fail to follow these recommendations. And by ignoring the root causes of disease and neglecting to prioritize lifestyle measures for prevention, the medical community is placing people at harm, or at least so say folks like this guy. Traditional medical care relies primarily on the application of drugs and surgery after the development of illness, whereas lifestyle medicine is primarily the use of optimal nutrition, whole foods, plant-based diet, and exercise in the prevention, arrest, and reversal of chronic conditions that would otherwise lead to premature disability and death by concentrating on the underlying causes of illness. Dr. Adrian Few Berman director of a wonderful organization I'm proud to support called Farmed Out, wrote a great editorial entitled Doctors Must Not Be Lapdogs to Drug Firms. The illusion that the relationship between medicine and the drug industry is collegial, professional, and personal is carefully maintained by the drug industry, which actually views all transactions with physicians in finely calculated financial terms. Big Pharma is happy to play the role of generous and genial uncle until physicians want to discuss subjects that are off-limits, such as the benefits of diet or exercise, or the relationship between medicine and drug companies. Let us not be a lapdog to Big Pharma. Rather than sitting contentedly in our master's lap, let us turn around and bite something tender. In 1978, chlorhydrins were found in protein hydrolysates. What does that mean? Proteins can be broken down into amino acids using a chemical process called hydrolysis, and free amino acids like glutamate can have taste-enhancing qualities. That's how they make cheap soy sauce and seasonings like Bragg's liquid aminos. This process requires high heat, high pressure, and hydrochloric acid to break apart the protein. The problem is that when any residual fat is exposed to these conditions, it can form toxic compounds called chlorohydrins. But when I say toxic, I'm talking about toxic to mice and rats. Chlorohydrins, like 3-MCPD, are considered a worldwide problem of food chemistry, but no clinical studies on humans have been reported so far. The concern is about detrimental effects on kidneys and fertility. In fact, there was a time in which it was considered as a potential male contraceptive because it could so affect sperm production. However, research funding was withdrawn after unacceptable side effects were observed in primates. They found flaccid testes in rats, which is what they were going for, but it caused neurological scars in monkeys. What do you do, though, when there are no studies in humans? How do you set some kind of safety factor? Well, it's not easy. I mean, what you do is take the lowest observed adverse effect level in animal studies, which in this case was kidney damage, then add in some kind of fudge factor and arrive at an estimated tolerable daily intake, which for 3-MCPD means that high-level consumers of soy sauce may exceed the limit. But this was based on extreme 
extraordinarily high contamination levels. Since then, Europe introduced a regulatory limit of 20 parts per billion of 3-MCPD in hydrolyzed vegetable protein products like liquid aminos and soy sauce. Um, the U.S. standards are much laxer, though, allowing 50 times more, 1,000 parts per billion. I called Braggs to see where they fell, and the good news is that they are doing independent third-party analysis of their liquid aminos for 3-MCPD. The bad news is that despite my pleas that they be fully transparent, they wouldn't let me share the results with you. I've seen them, though, but I'm only allowed to confirm they comfortably meet the U.S. standards, but fail the European standards. This is just the start of the 3-MCPD story. If you test people's urine for 3-MCPD or it's metabolized, 100% of people turn up positive, confirming that's a widespread food contaminant. I mean, 100% of people aren't downing soy sauce or liquid aminos every day. But remember, the chemical resulted from a reaction with residual vegetable oil. When vegetable oil itself is refined, when it's deodorized and bleached, those conditions also lead to the formation of 3-MCPD. And indeed, we've known for years that various foods are contaminated. And what kind of foods have these kinds of chemicals been detected? Well, if it's in the oils and fats, then it's in the greasy foods made from them— margarine, baked goods, pastries, deep-fried foods, and fatty snacks like potato and corn chips, as well as infant formula. Here's the FDA limit for soy sauce, 1,000. But donuts can have more than 1,200, salami more than 1,500, ham nearly 3,000, and french fries in excess of 6,000. So most people don't have to worry about this problem unless you're a consumer of fried food. For example, someone weighing about 150 pounds who eats 116 grams of donuts would exceed the maximum tolerable daily intake, even if that was their only source of exposure. Now, that's about two donuts, but the same limit-blowing amount of 3-MCPD could be found in only five french fries. Palm oil is the most commonly used vegetable oil in the world today. Pick up any package of processed junk in a box, bag, bottle, or jar, and odds are it'll have palm oil. Not only does it contain the primary cholesterol-raising saturated fat found mostly in meat and dairy, concerns have been raised about the safety of palm oil given the finding that it may contain a potentially toxic chemical contaminant known as 3-monochloropropane-1,2-diol, otherwise known as 3-MCPD, which is formed during the heat treatment involved in the refining of vegetable oils. So these contaminants end up being widespread in refined vegetable oils and fats in any products that contain them, including infant formulas. It's been found in all refined vegetable oils, but some are worse than others. The lowest levels of the toxic contaminants were found in canola oil, and the highest levels in palm oil. Based on the available data, this may result in a significant amount of human exposure, especially when used at deep-fry salty foods like french fries. In fact, just five fries could blow through the tolerable daily intake. Now, if you just do this once in a while, it shouldn't be a problem, but if you're eating fries every day or so, this could definitely be a health concern. Because the daily upper limit is based on body weight, particularly high exposure values were calculated for infants who are on formula rather than breast milk, since formula is made from refined oils, which, according to the European Food Safety Authority, may present a health risk and estimated U.S. infant exposures may be three to four times worse. If infants don't get breast milk, there's basically no alternative to industrial-produced infant formula. Given that fact, the vegetable oil industry needs to find a way to reduce the levels of these contaminants, and in the meanwhile, this is yet another reason that breast is always best. What can adults do to avoid exposure? Well, if these chemicals are created in the refining process of oils, what about sticking to unrefined oils? Refined oils have up to 32 times the 3-MCPD compared to their non-refined counterparts, with the exception of toasted sesame oil. Sesame oil is unrefined, they just squeeze the seeds, but because they're squeezing toasted sesame, the 3-MCPD may have come preformed virgin oils are by definition 
unrefined. They haven't been deodorized, the process by which most of the 3-MCPD is formed. In fact, that's how you can discriminate between the various processing grades of olive oil. If your so-called extra virgin olive oil contains MCPD, then it must have been diluted with some refined olive oil. The ease of adultering extra virgin olive oil, the difficulty of detection, the economic drivers, and the lack of control measures contribute to the susceptibility of extra virgin olive oil to fraud. How widespread a problem is it? Of the 88 bottles off store shelves tested, labeled extra virgin olive oil, only 33 were found to be authentic. OK, but what if you stick to the top-selling imported brands of extra virgin olive oil? 73% of those samples failed. Only about one in four appeared to be genuine, and not a single brand had even half their samples passed the test. Globally, 11 million deaths are attributable to dietary factors each year, placing poor diet ahead of any other risk factor for death in the world. Given that our diet is our leading killer, you'd think it would be emphasized in medical school, but there's a deficiency of nutrition education in medical training. A systematic review found that despite the centrality of nutrition to a healthy lifestyle, graduating medical students are not supported through their education to provide the necessary care. It could start in undergrad. But what's more important, learning about humanity's leading killer or organic chemistry? In medical school, students may average only 19 total hours of nutrition out of thousands of hours of instruction, and they're not even being taught what's most useful. How many cases of scurvy or beriberi, diseases of dietary deficiency, will they encounter in clinical practice? In contrast, how many of their future patients will be suffering from dietary excesses, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease? Those are probably a little more common. More than 9 out of 10 cardiologists surveyed believe that their role includes personally providing patients with at least basic nutrition information, yet less than 1 in 10 feel they have an expert grasp on the subject. If you look at the clinical guidelines for what we should do for our patients with regards to the number one killer, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, all treatment begins with a healthy lifestyle. Yet how can clinicians put these guidelines into practice without adequate training in nutrition? Fewer than 50% of medical schools reported teaching any nutrition in clinical practice. In fact, they may be effectively teaching anti-nutrition, as students typically begin medical school with a greater appreciation for the role of nutrition in health than when they leave. This is the percentage of med students at different schools indicating that nutrition is important to their careers upon entry into medical school. A smart bunch, about three-quarters on average. OK, but then after two years of instruction in medical school, they were asked the same question, and the numbers plummeted. In fact, at most schools it was 0%. Instead of being educated, they got de-educated had this silly notion that nutrition was important washed right out of their brains. Preclinical teaching, meaning the first two years of medical school, engenders a loss of a sense of the relevance of the applied discipline of nutrition. And following medical school, nutrition education during residency is minimal or, more typically, absent. Major updates were released in 2018 for residency and fellowship training requirements, and there were zero requirements for nutrition. Uh, so you could have an internal medicine graduate who comes out of some prestigious program who has learned nothing, literally nothing, about nutrition. Why isn't diet routinely addressed already in both medical education and practice, and what should be done about it? One of the reasons for the medical silence in nutrition, sadly, is that nutrition takes a back seat because there are few financial incentives to support it. What can we do about that? The Food Law and Policy Clinic at the Harvard Law School identified a dozen different policy levers at all stages of medical education, and the kinds of policy recommendations there could be for the decision makers. For instance, the government could require doctors, working at the VA at least, to get some courses in nutrition, or we could put 
questions about nutrition on board exams, so schools would be pressured to teach it. But as we are now, even patients who just had a heart attack aren't changing their diet. Doctors may not be telling them, and hospitals may be actively undermining their future with the food they serve the patients. The good news is the American Medical Association has passed a resolution encouraging healthy food options be available in hospitals. What a concept! The AMA hereby calls on U.S. hospitals to improve the health of patients, staff, and visitors by providing a variety of healthy food, including plant-based meals and meals that are low in fat, sodium, and added sugars, eliminating processed meats from menus, and providing and promoting healthy beverages. Nice. Similarly, in 2018, the state of California mandated the availability of plant-based meals for patients, and there are hospitals in Gainesville, Florida, the Bronx, Manhattan, Denver, and Tampa, all offering 100% plant-based meals to their patients on a separate menu and distributing materials to inpatients to improve their education on the role of diet, especially plant-based diets, in chronic disease. Let's check out some menus. Hmm, a little uh, lentil bolognese. Here's Montefiore's. A little cauliflower scramble with baked hash browns for breakfast, mushroom ragu for lunch, and a white bean stew for supper, soup, salad, and fruit for dessert. This is the first time a hospital menu ever made me hungry. Makes me want to get appendicitis and stay for a few days. The key to these transformations has been having a physician advocate and increasing education of staff and patients on the benefits of eating more plant-based foods. A single clinician can spark change in a whole system, because science is on their side. Doctors have a unique position in society to influence policy at all levels. It's about time we used it. Can mushrooms be medicinal? Mushroom-based products make up a sizable chunk of the $50 billion supplement market. This profitable trade provides a powerful incentive for companies to test the credulity of their customers, and sadly, unsupported assertions have come to define the medical mushroom business. For example, companies that market herbal medicines exploit references to studies on mice to promote their mushroom capsules for treating all kinds of ailments, but if you haven't noticed, uh, we're not mice. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if mushrooms have some potent properties. After all, fungi are where we got a bunch of drugs, not the least of which penicillin, and also a cholesterol-lowering drug lovastatin, and the powerful immunosuppressant drug cyclosporin. Still don't think a little mushroom could have pharmacological effects? Don't forget, they can produce some of our most powerful poisons. Uh, some kind of look the part, like the toxic Carolina false morel, all toadstooly and such, but others have more of an angelic look. Indeed, literally called the destroying angel, that's its name, and as little as a teaspoon can cause a painful, lingering death. So anyway, we should have respect for the pharmacological potential of mushrooms, but what can they do that's good for us? Well, consuming shiitake mushrooms daily improves human immunity, giving people just one or two dried shiitake mushrooms a day, about the weight equivalent of five to ten fresh ones for four weeks, resulted in an increase in proliferation of gamma-delta T lymphocytes and doubled the proliferation of natural killer cells. Gamma-delta cells act as a first line of immunological defense, and even better, natural killer cells kill cancer and the shiitake did all this while lowering markers of systemic inflammation. Oyster mushroom extracts don't seem to work as well, uh, but what we care about is if mushrooms can actually affect cancer outcomes. Uh, shiitakes haven't been tried yet, but reishi mushrooms have, after being used as a cancer treatment throughout Asia for centuries. Reishi mushroom for cancer treatment. What? does the science say. A meta-analysis of five randomized controlled trials showed that patients who had been given reishi mushroom supplements, along with chemo and radiation, were more likely to respond positively compared to just chemo and radiation alone. Now, although adding a reishi mushroom extract improved tumor response rates, the data failed to demonstrate a significant effect on tumor shrinkage when the mushrooms were used alone. So they aren't recommended as a single treatment, but rather an adjunct treatment for patients with advanced cancer. Now, 
Response rate just means the tumor shrinks. What we care about is whether or not it actually improves survival or quality of life. We don't have convincing data suggesting reishi mushroom products improve survival, but those randomized to reishi were found to have relatively better quality of life, so that's a win as far as I'm concerned. What about other mushrooms? Although whole shiitake mushrooms haven't been tested yet, there's a compound that's extracted from shiitakes called lentinin, uh, which is said to have completely inhibited the growth of a certain kind of sarcoma in mice. But in actuality, it only worked in one single strain of mice and failed in nine others. So are we more like the 90% of mouse strains in which it didn't work? Uh, we need human trials. And we finally got them. There are data on nearly 10,000 cancer patients who have been treated with the shiitake mushroom extract injected right into their veins. What did the researchers find? We'll find out next. A regular intake of mushrooms is said to make us healthier, fitter, and happier, and help us live longer. But what is the evidence for all that? Mushrooms are widely cited for their medicinal qualities, yet very few rigorous human intervention studies have been done. There is a compound called lentinin, extracted from shiitake mushrooms. To get about an ounce, you have to distill around 400 pounds of shiitake. <laughs> That's like 2,000 cups of mushrooms. But then you can inject the compound into cancer patients and see what happens. The pooled response from a dozen small clinical trials found that the objective response rate was significantly improved when lentinin was added to chemotherapy regimens for lung cancer. Objective response rate means like tumor shrinkage, but what we really care about is survival and quality of life. Does it actually make cancer patients live any longer or any better? Well, those in the lentinin group suffered less chemo-related toxicity to their gut and bone marrow, so that alone might be reason enough to use it. But what about improving survival? I was excited to see that lentinin evidently could significantly improve survival rates for a type of leukemia. And here it is. Adding lentinin increased average survival and reduced cachexia, which is like cancer-associated muscle wasting, and improved cage-side health. Uh, wait, what? How? Damn it, this was improved survival for brown Norwegian rats. So that so-called clinical benefit only applies if you're a veterinarian. A compilation of 17 actual human clinical studies did find improvements in one-year survival in advanced cancer patients, but no significant difference in the likelihood of living out to two years. Even the compilations of studies that purport that Lenten offers a significant advantage in terms of survival are talking about statistical significance. It's hard even to tell these survival curves apart. Lenten and improved survival by an average of 25 days. Now, 25 days is 25 days, but we should evaluate claims made by companies about the miraculous properties of medicinal mushrooms very critically. Lentinin has to be injected intravenously. What about mushroom extract supplements you can just take yourself? Shiitake mushroom extract is available through the internet for the treatment of prostate cancer for approximately $300 a month, so it's got to be good, right? Men who regularly eat mushrooms do seem to be at lower risk for getting prostate cancer, and not apparently just because they eat less meat or more fruits and vegetables in general, so why not give a shiitake mushroom extract a try? Because it doesn't work ineffective in the treatment of clinical prostate cancer. The results demonstrate that complementary and alternative medicine claims can actually be put to the test. What a concept! Maybe it should be mandatory before patients spend large sums of money on unproven treatments, or in this case, a disproven treatment. What about God's mushroom, also known as the mushroom of life, or reishi mushrooms? Conclusions. No significant anti-cancer effects were found, not even a single partial response. Maybe we're overthinking it? Plain white button mushroom. Extracts can kill off prostate cancer cells, at least in a petri dish, but so could the fancy God's mushroom, but that didn't end up working in people. You don't know if plain white button mushrooms work or not until you put it to the test. What I like about this study is that the researchers didn't use a proprietary extract, they just used regular whole mushrooms, dried and powdered, the equivalent of a half cup to a cup and a half of fresh white button mushrooms a day. In other words, a totally doable amount. 
They gave them to men with biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. Uh, what that means is the men had already gotten a prostatectomy or, or radiation in an attempt to cut or burn out all the cancer, but now it's back and growing, as evidenced by a rise in PSA levels, an indicator of prostate cancer progression. Of the 26 patients who got the button mushroom powder, four appeared to respond, meaning they got a drop in PSA levels by more than 50% after starting the shrooms. Here's where the four responders started out in the months leading up to starting the mushrooms. Um, patient 2 was my favorite. He had an exponential increase in PSA levels for a year. Then he started some plain white mushrooms, and boom! His PSA levels dropped down to zero and stays down. Similar type responses with patient 1. Uh, patient 4 had a partial response before his cancer took off again, and patient 3 appeared to have a delayed partial response. Now, in the majority of cases, the PSA levels continued to rise, not dipping at all. But even if there's only a 1 in 18 chance you'll be like these two, with a prolonged, complete response that continues to date, we're not talking about weighing the risks of some toxic chemotherapy for the small chance of benefit, just eating some inexpensive, easy-tasty plain white mushrooms every day. Yes, the study didn't have a control group, so it may have just been coincidence, but post-prostatectomy patients with rising PSAs are almost always indicators of cancer progression. And hey, uh, what's the downside? I mean, these two patients, their PSA levels became undetectable, suggesting that the cancer uh, disappeared altogether. They'd already gone through surgery, gotten their primary tumor removed, along with their entire prostate, already went through radiation to try to clean up any cancer that remained, and yet the cancer appeared to be surging back, until, that is, they started a little plain mushroom powder. If you search for heavy metal in the National Library of Medicine database, most of what you find is on heavy metal contamination in fish, for example, making it so hard to clearly establish the role of fish in a healthy diet, perhaps helping to explain the quintupling of odds of autoimmune diseases like juvenile arthritis, for instance. Uh, but searching the hazards of heavy metal also pops up entries like this on the risks from heavy metal music. Here they were talking about traumatic injuries from slamming around, but you're more likely to get injured at an alternative rock concert. It's the goo-goo dolls you've got to worry about, not nine-inch nails. OK, sure, music-induced hearing loss is a serious problem, but that can be from any loud music. It's interesting. Clinical recommendations include the 80 to 90 rule. No more than 80% of the maximum volume on personal listening devices for no more than 90 minutes a day. But that's not what the science shows. Do not exceed 60% of the maximum volume, maybe more evidence-based, but they figured teens would just ignore that, so they came up with a more acceptable advice. I assumed I'd see a lot of satanic panic nonsense from the 80s, where parents bereaved by suicide started suing heavy metal musicians. Uh, what kind of evidence did the parents present? There's been little scholarly research until this study that proceeded to try to correlate the number of statewide heavy metal magazine subscriptions to youth suicide rates. Oh, you got to be kidding. It got really crazy, though, when researchers called psychiatric institutions pretending to be parents worried because their son started listening to that heavy metal music, even though they made it clear that their son didn't exhibit any symptoms of mental illness, no drugs, no alcohol, and was doing fine at school, 10 of the 12 facilities believed the son required psychiatric hospitalization. Imagine what that would do to a kid. Turns out, if you actually come back a few decades later, metalheads were significantly happier in their youth and appear better psychologically adjusted than their peers. Some studies were just strange. Do Parkinson's patients walk better listening to Yellow Submarine or Master of Puppets? Other studies were just like, duh, heavy metal musicians exhibit a higher heart rate than those performing contemporary Christian. Not much of a shocker. Uh, some studies were kind of cute. The influence of music on promoting patient safety during surgery. Veterinary patients, kitties getting spayed with little earphones on their head. Turns out that adagio for strings may be more relaxing than ACDC. 
Our view on music therapy for human patients warned that caution should be exercised when guiding patients in selecting their music, as chaotic music, such as hip-hop and metal, is not healing to human cells, with three citations no less, though two of them don't say anything, and the third is a nursing newsletter merely quoting someone's opinion. But I did some digging, and it turns out stomach cancer cells like metal. If you play them Cannibal Corpse versus Beethoven, 12 hours of death metal increased their growth in a petri dish. That's so metal. But who puts headphones on their stomach? Or their chests, for that matter? Well, in one study, Mozart killed off one type of breast cancer cell line and not another. In another study, only Beethoven's fifth seemed to work, and Mozart flopped. When the petri dishes were surrounded by speakers and a little platform, how did they even get this stuff published? Anyway, the true danger from heavy metal is headbanging. Headbanging is a contemporary dance form consisting of abrupt flexion-extension movements of the head commonly seen in heavy metal. The number of avid aficionados is unknown, but some fans might be endangered by indulging excessively. Although generally considered harmless, health complications attributed to this practice include ripping your carotid artery, rupturing your lung, whiplash injury, and neck fracture, or in this case a subdermal hematoma. Now, this guy reported head banging at a Motorhead concert, and all that brisk forward and backward acceleration might have ruptured his bridging veins and caused him to bleed into his skull. Uh, bridging veins bridge the gap between the brain and the covering that lines the inside of your skull. And if the veins tear, blood can build up under your skull and compress your brain. This bridging vein rupture has been demonstrated on headbanging cadavers, again, a very metal study. It's been likened to a kind of shaken baby syndrome in adults. The researchers conclude that their case serves as evidence in support of Motorhead's rock and roll reputation. But I think the real takeaway is that a potentially dangerous complication like that can result from a seemingly benign activity. And some of the brain bleeds can be massive. Hmm, why did he have a headache after headbanging at a party? Here's the CT scan. This is all blood, squishing his brain over. It's amazing he survived, though this poor guy didn't. See, you can tear more than just veins. There are two sets of arteries that tunnel into the skull, the carotid arteries in the front and the vertebral arteries in the back, and you can tear both sets. A 15-year-old indulged in headbanging, ripping his carotid artery, which led to a massive stroke, and he presented half paralyzed and unable to speak, and died at a coma within a week. What about the vertebral arteries in the back? They're wedged into your skull, rendering them susceptible to shearing forces from extremes of neck motion, and that's exactly what appeared to happen, a heavy metal drummer tearing the wall of the artery. Now, obviously, all this is really rare, uh, probably afflicting less than one in a thousand or so. Uh, what can metalheads do to reduce their risk? To prevent injury due to such headbanging, the range of head and neck motion should be reduced. Slower tempo music should replace metal. Good luck with that. The frequency of headbanging could be only on every second beat. That's actually not a bad idea. Or personal protective equipment should be used. What, like a neck brace? Little formal injury research has been conducted on the worldwide phenomenon of headbanging, so researchers constructed a theoretical headbanging model with enough physics terms to make any nerd happy. Angular displacement, sinusoidal motion in a sagittal plane, amplitude of the displacement curve, study participants, headbangers. But you do need a control group. Easy listening music. Head injury curves? neck injury curves based on headbanging tempo and angular sweep. At an average headbanging tempo, we're trying to keep the range of motion under 75 degrees, so something like this. So to minimize the risk of head and neck injury, headbangers should decrease their range of head and neck motion. Oh, there's that personal protective equipment again. Unfortunately, it is difficult, if not impossible, to change the habits of heavy metal aficionados. Maybe what we need are metal-studded neck braces. In France, exposure to dietary contaminants was compared between vegetarians 
and meat eaters, and the results showed that exposures to persistent organic pollutants like PCBs and dioxins was dramatically lower among those eating more plant-based due to the non-consumption of foods of animal origins though they did have higher estimated exposure to some mycotoxins, fungal toxins present in moldy food. Now, there are lots of types of mold on the planet, and the vast majority are harmless. But over the last several years, certain mold toxins, such as aflatoxin and ochratoxin, have been popping up in breakfast cereals. Hundreds of samples were taken off store shelves, and about half were contaminated with ochratoxin, for example. But those were store shelves in Pakistan, and Pakistan has a subtropical climate with monsoons and flash floods, uh, leading to fungal propagation. But then similar results have popped up in Europe, Serbia, Spain, Portugal. Then mycotoxins were discovered in breakfast cereals in Canada. What about breakfast cereals in the United States? 144 samples were collected, and similar to other countries, about half were found to contain ochratoxin, but only about 7% exceeded the maximum limit established by the European Commission. What is the significance of the finding of ochratoxin in breakfast cereals from the United States? This was the largest study to date including nearly 500 samples of cereal off store shelves across the U.S. Overall detection rates were about 40%, and although only 16 violated the European standards, all of the cereals with ochratoxin were oat-based, making about 1 in 13 of the oat-based breakfast cereal samples tested being contaminated. Ochratoxin has become increasingly regulated by many countries to minimize chronic exposure. Here are the current regulations for mycotoxins in cereal-based baby foods worldwide, for example. Some countries are very strict, like in the European Union. Other countries, less so, and one country in particular has no standards at all. Ochratoxin is not currently regulated at all in the United States. What if you stick to organic products? One might expect them to actually be worse, owing to the fact that fungicides are not allowed in organic production. However, mycotoxin concentrations are usually similar or even reduced in organic compared to conventional products. For example, in one of the breakfast cereal studies, researchers found similar contamination, and the same was found for infant foods. It cannot be concluded that one is better than the other from a mycotoxin perspective. Despite no use of fungicides, organic systems appear generally able to maintain maintain mycotoxin contamination at low levels. But how much is that saying, given how widespread it is? How concerned should we be about the public health effects from long-term exposure of this potent mycotoxin? I mean, if you look at blood samples taken from populations going back decades, sometimes 100% of people turned out positive for ochratoxin circulating in their bloodstream. In some sense, they are unavoidable contaminants of food, since the detection of mycotoxins is not only easy and they can remain hidden. And once foods have become contaminated, mycotoxins aren't destroyed by cooking. So are there some foods we should simply try to avoid due to higher risk of contamination? That that's exactly the question I'm going to address next. Oats can be thought of as uniquely nutritious, and one route they improve human health is by providing prebiotics to increase the growth of beneficial gut microbiota. Of course, there are oats, and then there are oats, ranging from steel-cut oats to even better intact oat groats, their form before being cut, all the way down to highly processed cereals such as Honey Nut Cheerios. Rolling crushes the grain, which may disrupt cell walls and damage starch granules, making them more available for digestion, which is bad since we want the starch to make it all the way down to our colon to feed our good gut bacteria, and grinding into oat flour to make breakfast cereals is even worse. If you compare the blood sugar and insulin responses, you can see significantly lower spikes with the more intact steel-cut oats. OK, but what about ochratoxin? The leading source of dietary exposure of this mold contaminant, uh, but they aren't the only source. Uh, there's a worldwide contamination of food crops with mycotoxins, with some experts throwing around estimates as high as 25% of the world's crops. Uh, that statistic is attributed to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, but it turns out that stat is bogus. It's not 25%. Instead, it may be more like 60 to 80%. The high occurrence is likely explained by a combination of the improved sensitivity of testing methods as well as the impact of climate change. 
Spices have been found to have some of the highest concentrations of mycotoxins, but because they're ingested in such small quantities, they aren't considered to be a significant source. We can certainly do our part to minimize risk, though. It is also the consumer's responsibility to keep spices dry after opening sealed containers or packages. What about dried herbs? Mycotoxins in plant-based dietary supplements. The highest mycotoxin concentrations were found in milk thistle-based supplements. It turns out wet and humid weather is needed during milk thistle harvest, which evidently is why they end up being so moldy. Considering the fact that milk thistle preparations are mainly used by people who suffer from liver disease, such high intake of compounds toxic to the liver may present some concern. Wine, sourced from the United States, also appears to have particularly high levels. In fact, the single highest level found to date around the world is in American wine. But there is contamination in wine in general. In fact, some suggest that's why we see such consistent levels in people's blood, perhaps because lots of people are regular wine drinkers. Ochratoxin is said to be a kidney toxin with immunosuppressive birth defect causing carcinogenic properties. Uh, so what about ochratoxin decontamination, removing the toxin in wine? Uh, now ideally we'd try to prevent the contamination in the first place, but since this isn't always practical, there is increased focus on finding effective methods of detoxification of mycotoxins already present in foods, and that's where yeast comes in as a promising solution, because the mycotoxins bind to the yeast cell wall. The thought is that you could strain out the yeast, but another approach would be to eat something like nutritional yeast to prevent the absorption. It works in chickens. Give yeast along with aflatoxin, another mycotoxin, and you diminish the severity of the resulting disease. But using something like nutritional yeast as a binder depends on the stability of the yeast mycotoxin bond throughout the digestive tract. Uh, we know yeast can remove ochratoxin in foods, but we didn't have a clue if it would work in the gut until 2016. Yeast was found to bind up to 44% of the ochratoxin, but in actuality it was probably closer to only about a third since some of the bindings weren't stable. So if you're trying to stay under the maximum daily intake and you drink a single glass of wine, even if your bar snack is popcorn seasoned with nutritional yeast, you'd still probably exceed the tolerable intake. But what does that mean? How bad is the stuff? We'll find out next. Ochratoxin has been described as toxic to the immune system, developing fetus, kidneys, and nervous system, as well as being carcinogenic. But that's in animal studies. Ochratoxin causes kidney toxicity in certain animal species, but there's little documented evidence of adverse effects in humans. Uh, that's why it's only considered a possible human carcinogen. Big Ag assures that current ochratoxin levels are safe, even among those who eat a lot of contaminated foods. The worst-case scenario may be young children eating a lot of oat-based cereals, but even then, their lifetime cancer risk is considered negligible, with those arguing against regulatory standards suggesting you can eat more than 42 cups of oatmeal a day and not worry about it. Uh, where do they get these kinds of estimates? They determined the so-called benchmark dose in animals, the dose of the toxin that gives a 10% increase in pathology, and then because you want to err on the side of caution, you divide that dose by 500 as a kind of safety fudge factor to develop the tolerable daily intake. For cancer risk, you can find the tumor dose, the dose that increases tumor incidence in lab animals by 5%, and extrapolate down to the negligible cancer risk intake, effectively incorporating a 5 thousand-fold safety factor. Seems kind of arbitrary, right? But what else are you going to do? I mean, you can't just intentionally feed people the stuff and see what happens. Though, hey, look, people eat it all the time. Can we just follow people and their diets out over time and see if people who eat more whole grains like oats, for example, are more likely to have cancer or live shorter lives? What is the association between whole grain intake and all-cause, cardiovascular, and cancer mortality? Every additional ounce of whole grains a day is associated not only with a lower risk for cancer, but also a lower risk of dying from all causes put together. Here are all the big cancer studies. Every single one 
if anything, trended towards lower cancer risk. Bottom line is that you don't find adverse effects confirmed in these population studies. Um, this is not to say ochratoxin is necessarily harmless, but any such risk it does pose doesn't outweigh the known benefits of whole grain consumption. And in fact, healthy constituents of the whole grains themselves, like the antioxidants, may directly reduce the impacts of mycotoxins by protecting cells from damage, so eating lots of fruits and vegetables may also help. Either way, a healthy diet can play a significant role in mitigating the risk. In summary, healthy foods like whole grains are good, but not as good as they could be because of ochratoxin, whereas less healthful foods like wine and pork are worse because of the mycotoxin. Ochratoxin was detected, for example, in 44% of tested pork. In recent years, mold has been blamed for all sorts of vague subjective symptoms, but we have little scientific evidence that mold has anything to do with them. However, this concept of toxic mold syndrome has permeated the public consciousness, perpetuated by disreputable predatory practices by those making money testing homes for mold spores or testing people's urine or blood. But all these tests are said to just further propagate misinformation and inflict unnecessary and often exorbitant costs on patients desperate for a diagnosis. The continued belief in this myth is perpetuated by those charlatans who believe that measles vaccines cause autism, that homeopathy works, and that fluoride in the water should be removed. Mold toxin contamination of food, however, has emerged as a legitimate issue of serious concern, and perhaps even more important than other contaminants that might make their way into the food supply. Hundreds of different types have been identified, but only one has been classified as a known human carcinogen, and that's aflatoxin. The ochratoxin I talked about before is a possible human carcinogen, but we know aflatoxin causes cancer in human beings. In fact, aflatoxins are amongst the most powerful carcinogens we know about. For example, it's been estimated that about a fifth of all liver cancer cases may be attributable to aflatoxins. And since liver cancer is the third leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide and kills so rapidly after diagnosis, the contribution of aflatoxins to this deadly cancer is quite significant. And once it makes it into food, there's almost nothing you can do to remove it. Cooking, for example, doesn't help. So once it makes it into crops, or the meat, dairy, and eggs from animals consuming those crops, it's too late. So we have to prevent contamination in the first place. And that's what we've been doing for decades in this country. Because of government regulations, companies are almost always sampling for aflatoxin, resulting in nearly a billion dollars in losses every year, which may get worse if climate change worsens aflatoxin contamination in the Midwest Corn Belt. So on a consumer level, it's really more of a public health problem in the less industrialized world, such as African countries, where conditions are ripe and farmers can't afford to throw away a billion dollars worth of crops. Indeed, aflatoxin remains a public health threat in Africa, rural China, and Southeast Asia, affecting more than half of humanity, which explains why the prevalence of liver cancer in those areas may be 30 times higher, uh, but it is not a major problem in the U.S. or Europe. For example, only about 1% of Americans have detectable levels of aflatoxins in their bloodstream. Why even 1%, though? Well, the FDA works to ensure that the levels of exposure to these toxins are not kept as low as possible, but instead as low as practical. For example, in California, there's been an increase in unacceptable aflatoxin levels in pistachios, almonds, and figs. Uh, unacceptable in Europe, that is, so it affects our ability to export, but not necessarily unacceptable for U.S. consumers, as we allow twice as much aflatoxin contamination. Uh, figs are unique, since they're allowed to dry on the tree. This makes them particularly susceptible to aflatoxin production. It would be interesting to know about the fig-consuming habits of the 1% of Americans who turned up positive for the toxin. If figs were to blame, I'd encourage people to you know, diversify their dried fruit consumption, but nuts are so good for us that we'd really want to keep them in our diet. The cardiovascular health benefits outweigh the carcinogenic effects, preventing thousands of strokes and heart attacks for every one case of liver cancer. Thus, the population health benefits provided by increased nut consumption clearly outweigh the risks associated with the increased aflatoxin exposure. So we're left with aflatoxin being mostly a problem in the developing world, and because of that, it remains a largely and rather shamefully ignored global health issue. Where attention has been paid, it's been largely driven by the need to meet stringent import regulations in the richer nations of the world, rather 
than protect the billions of people exposed on a daily basis. Almost 2,500 years ago, Hippocrates stated that all disease begins in the gut. Feed our gut bacteria right with whole plant foods, and they feed us right back with beneficial compounds like butyrate, which our gut bugs make from fiber. Feed them wrong, on the other hand, and they can produce detrimental compounds like TMAO, which our gut bugs make from cheese, seafood, eggs, and meat. Now, we used to think that TMAO only contributed to cardiovascular diseases like heart disease and stroke, but more recently, it's been linked to everything from psoriatic arthritis to polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, I'm most concerned about our leading killers, though. If we look at the top 10 causes of death in the United States, we know about heart disease and stroke, killers number 1 and 5, but recently an association has been found between blood levels of TMAO and the risks of various cancers, killer number 2. It could be the inflammation caused by TMAO that explains the link between TMAO and cancer, but it could also be oxidative stress, such as free radicals, DNA damage, or a disruption in protein folding. Killer number four are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema, and TMAO is associated with premature death in patients with exacerbated COPD, though they suspect it's just due to them dying from more cardiovascular disease. The link to stroke is a no-brainer, no pun intended, because of the higher blood pressure associated with higher TMAO levels, as well as the greater likelihood of clot formation in those with atrial fibrillation. And those with higher TMAO levels also appear to have worse strokes, and four times the odds of death. Killer number six is Alzheimer's disease. Does TMAO even get up into the brain? Yes. TMAO is present in human cerebrospinal fluid, which bathes the brain, and indeed the levels are higher in both those with mild cognitive dysfunction and those with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. In the brain, TMAO has been shown to induce neuronal senescence, meaning uh, deterioration with age, uh, increased oxidative stress, and impaired mitochondrial function, all of which may contribute to brain aging and cognitive impairment. Killer number seven is diabetes, and people with higher TMO levels are approximately 50% more likely to have diabetes too. Killer number eight is pneumonia. TMAO predicts fatal outcomes in pneumonia patients, even without evident heart disease. And killer number nine is kidney disease, and TMAO is strongly related to kidney function and predicts fatal outcomes there as well. Over a period of five years, more than half of chronic kidney disease patients who started out with an average or higher TMAO levels were dead, whereas among those in the lowest third of levels, nearly 90% remained alive. OK, OK, so how can we lower the TMAO levels in our blood? Because TMAO originates from dietary sources, we could limit our intake of choline and carnitine-rich foods, but they're quote-unquote so widespread, we're talking meat, eggs, and dairy. Therefore, restriction of foods rich in TMAO-creating nutrients may not be practical. I mean, can't we just get a vegan fecal transplant? Vegan donors were kind enough to provide the investigators with a fresh morning sample. If you remember, if you give a vegan a steak, despite all the carnitine in the meat, they make almost no TMAO compared to a meat eater, presumably because they haven't been fostering steak-eating bugs in their gut. Remarkably, even if you give plant-based eaters the equivalent of a 20-ounce steak every day for two months, only about half start ramping up production of TMAO, showing just how far their gut flora had to change. The capacity of veggie feces to churn out TMAO is almost non-existent, so instead of eating healthier, why not just get some of that sweet vegan poop off the brown market? In a double-blind or randomized controlled trial, research subjects either got vegan poop or their own poop back. Uh, the complete stool production was stirred, not shaken, and then infused through a hose down their nose, and it didn't work. Uh, first of all, uh, the vegans they recruited for their study started out making TMAO themselves, as opposed to the other study where they didn't make any at all. Uh, this may be because the other study required the vegans to have been plant-based for at least a year, and this study didn't. So yeah, not much of a change in TMAO running through their bodies two weeks after getting the vegan poop, but the vegan poop they got seemed to start out with some capacity to produce TMAO in the first place. 
so the failure to improve after the vegan fecal transplant could be related to limited baseline microbiome differences, as well as the continuation of an omnivorous diet after the transplant. Well, what's the point of trying to reset your microbiome if you're just going to eat meat? Well, the researchers didn't want to switch people to a plant-based diet, since they knew that alone can change your microbiome, and they didn't want to introduce any extra factors. Bottom line, no pun intended, it looks like there may not be any shortcuts. We may just have to eat a healthier diet. There's a new nut on the market called Baru almonds, branded as barucas, or just Baru nuts. Technically, it isn't a nut, but a seed that's native to the Brazilian savanna, known as the Cerrado, uh, which is sadly now among the most threatened ecosystems in the world. Over the last 30 years, extensive cattle ranching and feed crop production to fattened said cattle have destroyed much of this ecosystem. So hey, if we can make it profitable not to cut down the native trees by selling barrow nuts, for example, then that could be good for the ecosystem's health. But uh, what about our health? Although barrow nuts are popular and widely consumed, few studies report on their biological properties. And they do have a lot of polyphenol phytonutrients, presumably accounting for their high antioxidant activity, and 90% of the phytonutrients are present in the peel. So are they nutritious? Sure. Uh, but do they have any special health benefits? And not just for the treatment of chubby mice. Groups fed barrow nuts showed lower cholesterol, supposedly indicating that they have a great potential for dietary use in preventing and controlling cholesterol problems. But the groups were rats, and that was compared to lard. <laughs> Basically, anything lowers your cholesterol compared to eating lard. Nevertheless, there haven't been any reports about the effects of barrow almond consumption on human health until this study. A randomized controlled study of humans found that eating less than an ounce a day for six weeks led to a 9% drop in LDL cholesterol. Uh, 20 grams would be about 15 nuts, or a palm full. Like many other nut studies, even though the research subjects were told to add nuts to their regular diets, there was no weight gain, presumably because nuts are so filling you inadvertently cut down other foods throughout the day. How good is a 9.4% drop in LDL? Well, that's the kind of drop you can get from regular almonds, though macadamias and pistachios may work even better. But those were at much higher doses. So it appeared 20 grams of barrow nuts worked as well as 73 grams of almonds. And so on a per-serving basis, or a per-calorie basis, barrow nuts really did seem to be special. Uh, now, there are lower-dose nut studies showing similar, even better results. Here people were given 25 grams of almonds for just four weeks and got about a 6% drop. And in this study, people were given just 10 grams of almonds a day. I mean, we're talking just like seven individual almonds a day, and got more like a 30% drop in the same time frame as the barrow nuts, three times better at half the dose with regular almonds. The biggest reason we're more confident in regular almonds is that studies have been done over and over, more than a dozen randomized controlled trials, whereas in the only other cholesterol trial of barrow nuts, there was no significant benefit at all for LDL cholesterol, even at the same 20-gram dose given for even longer, a period of eight weeks. Mm, that's a bummer. The primary reason I would suggest choosing other nuts instead, though, is that you can't get barrow nuts raw. They contain certain compounds that have to be inactivated by heat before human consumption. So the reason raw nuts are preferable is because of advanced glycation end products, so-called glycotoxins, which are known to contribute to increased oxidative stress and inflammation. Glycotoxins are naturally present in uncooked animal-derived foods, but then dry heat cooking like grilling can make things worse. So the three highest levels recorded are bacon, broiled hot dogs, and roasted barbecue chicken skin. Nothing comes close to that. Uh, chicken McNuggets come in here. Anyway, any foods high in fat and protein can create AGEs at high enough temperatures. So although plant foods tend to contain relatively few AGEs, even after cooking, there are some high-fat, high-protein plant foods. For example, boiled tofu, like in a soup, is down here, but the same serving size of broiled 
tofu is up here. Now again, with most plant foods, it's not at all a problem. Like, uh, here's a raw apple, and here's a baked apple. Uh, doesn't really matter, since it's not high fat or high protein. I was surprised that veggie burgers were so low, even when baked or fried, but nuts and seeds are up in tofu territory, especially when roasted, which is why I would recommend raw nuts and seeds and nut and seed butters whenever you have a choice. The treatment of obesity has long been stained by the snake oil swindling of profiteers, hustlers, and quacks. Even the modern field of bariatric medicine, derived from the Greek word baros, meaning weight, is pervaded by an insidious image of sleaze. Beguiled by advertising for fairy tale magic bullets of rapid effortless weight loss, people blame themselves for failing to manifest a miracle or imagine themselves metabolically broken. On the other end of the spectrum are overly pessimistic practitioners of the opinion that people who are fat are born fat, and nothing can be done about it. The truth lies somewhere in between. The difficulty of curing obesity has been compared to learning a foreign language. It's an achievement virtually anyone can attain with a sufficient investment of energies, but it always takes considerable time and effort and of those who do stick with it, most will regain much of the weight lost. Uh, to me, this speaks to the difficulty rather than the futility. It may take smokers an average of 30 quit attempts to finally kick the habit. Uh, like, quitting smoking is just something that has to be done. As the chair of the Association for the Study of Obesity put it, it doesn't take willpower to do essential tasks like getting up at night to feed a baby. It's just something that has to be done. Our collective response doesn't seem to match the rhetoric or reality. If obesity is such a national crisis, reaching alarming proportions dubbed by the post-9-11 Surgeon General as every bit as devastating as terrorism, why has our reaction been so tepid? For example, governments meekly suggest the food industry take voluntary initiatives to restrict the marketing of less healthy food options to children. Uh, have we just given up and ceded control? Our timid response to the obesity epidemic is encapsulated by a national initiative promulgated by a joint task force of the American Society for Nutrition, Institute of Food Technologists, and International Food Information Council, the Small Changes Approach. Since small changes are more feasible, suggestions include using mustard instead of mayonnaise, and eating one rather than two donuts in the morning. Seems a bit like bringing a butter knife to a gunfight but with only one croissant. Proponents of the small changes approach lament that unlike other addictions, for example alcohol, cocaine, gambling, or tobacco, we can't counsel our obese patients to give up the addictive element completely, as no one can give up eating. But just because we have to eat doesn't mean we have to eat junk. Like, just because we have to breathe doesn't mean it has to be through the end of a cigarette. What about bringing a scalpel to the gunfight instead? The use of bariatric surgery has exploded from about 40,000 procedures noted in the first international survey in 1998 to now hundreds of thousands performed every year in the United States alone. The first technique developed, the intestinal bypass, involved carving out about 19 feet of intestines. More than 30,000 intestinal bypass operations were performed before catastrophic disastrous outcomes were recognized, including protein deficiency-induced liver disease, which often progressed to liver failure and death. This inauspicious start is remembered as one of the dark blots in the history of surgery. Today, death rates after bariatric surgery are considered very low, occurring on average in perhaps 1 in 300 to 1 in 500 patients, the most common procedure is stomach stapling, also known as sleeve gastrectomy, in which most of the stomach is permanently removed. Only a narrow tube of stomach is left so as to restrict how much food people can eat at any one time. You know, it's ironic that many patients choose bariatric surgery convinced that diets don't work for them, when in reality that's all the surgery may be, an enforced diet. Bariatric surgery can be thought of as a form of internal jaw wiring. Gastric bypass, known as Roux and Y gastric bypass, is the second most common bariatric surgery. It combines restriction, stapling the stomach into a pouch smaller than a golf ball, with 
malabsorption, by rearranging your anatomy to bypass the first part of your small intestine. It appears to be more effective than just cutting out most of the stomach, and results in a loss of about 63% of excess weight, compared to 53% with a gastric sleeve. But gastric bypass carries a greater risk of serious complications. Uh, many are surprised to learn that new surgical procedures don't require pre-market testing or FDA approval, and are largely exempt from rigorous regulatory scrutiny. After sleeve gastrectomy and Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, the third most common bariatric procedure is a revision to fix a previous bariatric procedure. Up to 25% of bariatric patients have to go back into the operating room for problems caused by their first bariatric surgery, and reoperations are riskier, carrying around 10 times the mortality rate and offer no guarantee of success. Complications include leaks, fistulas, ulcers, strictures, erosions, obstructions, and severe acid reflux. The extent of risk may depend on the skill of the surgeon. In a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, bariatric surgeons voluntarily submitted videos of themselves performing surgery to a panel of their peers for evaluation. Technical proficiency varied widely and was related to the rates of complications, hospital readmissions, reoperations, and death. Patients operated on by the less competent surgeons suffered nearly three times the complications and five times the risk of death. As with athletes and musicians, some surgeons may simply be more talented than others, but practice may help make perfect. Gastric bypass is such a complicated procedure that the learning curve may require 500 cases for a surgeon to master the procedure. Complications risk plateaus after about 500 cases with the lowest risk, found among surgeons who perform more than 600 bypasses. The risk of not making it out alive may be double under the knife of those who've done less than 75, compared to more than 450. So if you do choose to undergo the operation, I'd recommend asking your surgeon how many procedures they've done, as well as choosing an accredited bariatric center of excellence, where surgical mortality appears to be two to three times lower than non-accredited institutions. Um, it's not always the surgeon's fault, though. In a report entitled The Dangers of Broccoli, a surgeon described a case in which a woman went to an all-you-can-eat buffet three months after her gastric bypass operation, but chose really healthy foods. Good for her. Uh, she just evidently forgot to chew. Her staples blew, and she ended up in the ER, then the OR. They opened her up and found full chunks of broccoli, whole lima beans, and other green leafy vegetables inside her abdominal cavity. A cautionary tale, to be sure, but perhaps less about chewing food better after surgery than about chewing better foods before surgery, so you can keep all your internal organs intact in the first place. Even if the surgical procedure goes perfectly, Lifelong nutritional replacement and monitoring are required to avoid vitamin and mineral deficits. This includes more than just a little anemia, osteoporosis, or hair loss, but full-blown cases of life-threatening deficiencies, such as beriberi, pellagrin, quashiorc, or end nerve damage that can manifest as vision loss years or even decades after surgery in the case of copper deficiency. Tragically, in cases of severe deficiency of a B vitamin called thiamine, nearly one in three patients progressed to permanent brain damage before the condition was caught. The malabsorption of nutrients is on purpose for procedures like gastric bypass. By cutting out segments of the intestines, you can successfully impair the absorption of calories, but at the expense of impairing the absorption of necessary nutrition. Even people who just undergo restrictive procedures like stomach stapling can be at risk for life-threatening nutrient deficiencies because of persistent vomiting. Indeed, uh, vomiting is reported by up to 60% of patients after bariatric surgery due to inappropriate eating behaviors, in other words, trying to eat normally. The vomiting helps with weight loss, similar to the way a, a drug for alcoholics called antabuse can be used to make them so violently ill after a drink that they eventually can learn their lesson. Dumping syndrome can work the same way. A large percentage of gastric bypass patients can suffer from abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, bloating, fatigue, or palpitations after eating calorie-rich foods as they bypass your stomach and dump straight into your intestines. As surgeons describe it, this is a feature, not a bug. Dumping syndrome is an expected and desired part of the behavior modification caused by gastric bypass surgery. It can deter patients from consuming energy-dense food. 
The surgical community objects to the characterization of bariatric surgery as merely internal jaw wiring, cutting into healthy organs just to discipline people's behavior. They've gone as far as to rename it metabolic surgery, suggesting the anatomical rearrangements cause changes in digestive hormones that offer unique physiological benefits. As evidence, they point to the remarkable remission rates for type 2 diabetes. After bariatric surgery, about 50% of obese diabetics and 75% of super-obese diabetics go into remission, meaning they have normal blood sugars on a regular diet off all diabetes medications. The normalization in blood sugars can happen within literally days after the surgery, and then 15 years after the surgery, 30% may remain free from their diabetes uh, compared to a 7% cure rate in a non-surgical control group. Are we sure it was the surgery, though? One of the most challenging parts of bariatric surgery is lifting the liver. Since obese individuals tend to have such large fatty livers, this can be tricky, risking liver injury and bleeding. Enlarged livers are one of the most common reasons less invasive laparoscopic surgery turns into fully invasive open surgery, leaving the patient with a large full belly scar and increased risk of wound infections, complications, and recovery time. But lose even just 5% of your body weight, and your fatty liver may shrink by 10%. That's why those awaiting bariatric surgery are put on a diet. Then after surgery, patients are typically placed on an extremely low-calorie liquid diet for weeks. Could their improvement in blood sugars just be from the calorie restriction, rather than some sort of surgical metabolic magic? Researchers decided to put it to the test. At a bariatric surgery clinic at the University of Texas, Patients with type 2 diabetes scheduled for gastric bypass volunteered to first undergo an identical period of calorie restriction, but without the surgery. They were placed in the hospital and put on the same diet they would be on immediately before and after the surgery for 10 days, averaging less than 500 calories a day to mimic the surgical situation. Then the researchers waited a few months so the patients would gain the weight back, and then put them through the actual surgery matched day to day for the diets they were on before. So same patients, same diets, just with or without the actual surgery. If there was some sort of metabolic benefit to the anatomical rearrangement, they would have done better after the actual surgery, but in some ways they actually did worse. The calorie restriction alone resulted in similar improvements in blood sugar, pancreatic function, and insulin sensitivity, but several measures of diabetic control improved significantly more without the surgery, so the surgery seemed to put them at a metabolic disadvantage. The calorie restriction works by first mobilizing fat out of the liver. Type 2 diabetes is thought to be caused by fat building up in the liver and then spilling over into the pancreas. Everyone may have a personal fat threshold for the safe storage of excess fat. When that limit is exceeded, fat gets deposited into the liver, uh, where it causes insulin resistance. Uh, the liver attempts to offload some of the fat in the form of a fat transport molecule called VLDL, which then gets stuck in the pancreas and can kill off the cells that produce insulin. By the time diabetes is diagnosed, half of our insulin-producing cells may have been destroyed. Put people on a low-calorie diet, though, and the entire process can be reversed. A large enough negative calorie balance can cause a profound drop in liver fat sufficient to resurrect liver insulin sensitivity within seven days. Keep it up, and the liver stops spitting out fat enough to help normalize pancreatic fat levels and function within just eight weeks. Once you drop below your personal fat threshold, you should then be able to resume normal intake and still keep your diabetes at bay. The bottom line is that type 2 diabetes is reversible with weight loss if you catch it early enough. Lose more than 30 pounds, and nearly 90% of those who've had type 2 diabetes for less than four years can achieve remission, whereas it may only be reversible in 50% of those who've lived with the disease for longer than eight years. That's losing weight with diet alone, though. The remission numbers for diabetics losing even more than twice as much weight with bariatric surgery may only be around 75% up to 8 years and 40% after that. Losing weight without resorting to surgery may offer other benefits as well. Uh, diabetics losing weight with diet alone can significantly improve markers of systemic inflammation, such as tumor necrosis factor, whereas levels significantly worsened when about the same amount of weight was lost from a gastric bypass. What about diabetic complications? 
Well, one of the reasons we don't want diabetes is we don't want to go blind, and we don't want to have to go on dialysis. Reversing diabetes with bariatric surgery can improve kidney function, but surprisingly it may not prevent the appearance or progression of diabetic vision loss, perhaps because bariatric surgery affects diet quantity, but not necessarily diet quality. This reminds me of a famous study published in the New England Journal of Medicine that randomized thousands of diabetics to an intensive lifestyle program that focused on weight loss. Ten years in, the study was stopped prematurely because the diabetics weren't living any longer or having any fewer heart attacks. This may be because they remained on the same heart-clogging diet, but just in smaller portions. How sustainable is the weight loss from bariatric surgery? Most gastric bypass patients end up regaining some of the fat they lose over the first year or two after surgery, but five years later, three-quarters maintain at least a 20% weight loss. The typical trajectory for someone who starts out obese at 285 pounds, for example, would be to drop to an overweight 178 pounds two years after bariatric surgery, but then regain back up to an obese 207 pounds. Uh, this has been chalked up to grazing behavior, where compulsive eaters may shift from binging, which becomes more difficult post-surgery, to eating smaller amounts constantly throughout the day. Eight years out, about half of gastric bypass patients continue to describe episodes of disordered eating. As one pediatric obesity specialist described, I have seen many patients who put chocolate bars into a blender with some cream just to pass technically installed obstacles like a gastric band. Bariatric surgery advertising is filled with happily ever after fairy tale narratives of cherry picked outcomes, offering, as one ad analysis put it, the full Cinderella romance happy ending. This may contribute to the finding that patients often overestimate the amount of weight they'll lose with the procedure and underestimate the difficulty of the recovery process. Surgery forces profound changes in eating habits requiring slow, thoroughly chewed small bites. Your stomach goes from the volume of two softballs to down to the size of a half a tennis ball in stomach stapling and half of a ping-pong ball in the case of gastric bypass or banding. As you can imagine, weight regain after surgery can have a devastating psychological effects, as patients may feel they failed their last resort. This may explain why bariatric surgery patients are at a high risk of depression and suicide. Now, uh, severe obesity alone may increase risk of suicidal depression, but even at the same weight, those going through surgery appear to be at higher risk. At the same BMI, age, and gender, bariatric surgery recipients have nearly four times the odds of suicide compared with counterparts not undergoing the procedure. Most convincingly, before and after mirror image analyses show the risk of serious self-harm increases post-surgery among the same individuals. About 1 in 50 bariatric surgery patients end up killing themselves or being hospitalized for self-harm or attempted suicide. And this only includes confirmed suicides, excluding masked attempts such as overdoses of undetermined intention. Bariatric surgery patients also have an elevated risk of accidental death, though some of this may be due to changes in alcohol metabolism. Give gastric bypass folks two shots of vodka, and because of their altered anatomy, their blood alcohol level shoots past the legal driving limit within minutes. It's unclear whether this plays a role in the 25% increase in prevalence of alcohol problems noted during the second postoperative year. Even those who successfully lose their excess weight and keep it off appear to have a hard time coping. I mean, Ten years out, though physical health-related quality of life improves, general mental health tends to significantly deteriorate compared to pre-surgical level, even among the biggest losers. Ironically, there's a common notion that bariatric surgery is for cheaters who take the easy way out by choosing the low-effort method of weight loss. Shedding the pounds may not shed the stigma of even prior obesity. Studies suggest that in the eyes of others, knowing someone was fat in the past leads them to always be treated more like a fat person. And there's a strong anti-surgery bias on top of that, such that those who choose the scalpel to lose weight are rated most negatively, for example, being considered less physically attractive. One can imagine how remaining a target of prejudice, even after joining the in-group, could potentially undercut psychological well-being. 
There can also be unexpected physical consequences of massive weight loss, like large hanging flaps of excess skin. Beyond being heavy and uncomfortable and interfering with movement, the skin flaps can result in itching, irritation, dermatitis, and skin infections. Getting a paniculectomy, uh, removing the abdominal apron of hanging skin, it can be expensive and has a complication rate exceeding 50%, with dehiscence, uh, rupturing of the surgical wound, being the most common complication. Even if surgery proves sustainably effective, wrote the founding director of Yale University's Prevention Research Center, the need to rely on the rearrangement of our natural gastrointestinal anatomy as an alternative to better use of feet and forks, diet and exercise, seems a societal travesty. In the Middle Ages, starving peasants dreamed of gastronomic utopias where food just rained down from the sky. The English called it the Kingdom of Cocaine, Little could medieval fabulous predict that many of their descendants would not only take permanent residence there, but cut out parts of their stomachs and intestines to combat the abundance. Critics have pointed out the irony of surgically altering healthy organs to make them dysfunctional, malabsorptive, on purpose, especially when it comes to operating on children. Bariatric surgery for kids and teens has become widespread, and is being performed on children as young as five years old. Surgeons defend the practice by arguing that growing up fat can leave emotional scars and quote-unquote lifelong social retardation. Promoters of preventive medicine argue that bariatric surgery is the proverbial ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. In response, proponents of pediatric bariatric surgery have written it is often pointed out that we should focus on prevention. But of course, I agree. However, if someone is drowning, I don't tell them, you should learn how to swim. No, I rescue them. A strong case can be made that the benefits of bariatric surgery far outweigh the risks, if the alternative is remaining morbidly obese, which is estimated to shave up to a dozen or more years off of one's life. Although there haven't been any data from randomized trial to back it up yet, compared to non-operated obese individuals, those getting bariatric surgery would be expected to live significantly longer on average. No wonder surgeons consistently frame the elective surgery as a life-or-death necessity. Uh, this is a false dichotomy, though. The benefits only outweigh the risks if there are no other alternatives. Might there be a way to lose weight healthfully without resorting to the operating table? That's what my book, How Not to Diet, is all about. 50 million Americans suffer from arthritis. An osteoarthritis of the knee is the most common form, making it a leading cause of disability. Several inflammatory pathways underlie the onset and progression of the disease, so various anti-inflammatory foods have been put to the test. Strawberries decrease the levels circulating in the blood of an inflammatory mediator known as tumor necrosis factor, but that doesn't necessarily translate into clinical improvement. Uh, for example, drinking cherry juice can lower a sign of inflammation known as C-reactive protein, but it failed to help with the disease. Uh, but wait, it says provided symptom relief. Yeah, it did, but no better than placebo, meaning drinking it was essentially no better than doing nothing. Uh, cherries may help with another kind of arthritis called gout, but they failed when it came to osteoarthritis. Same with pomegranate juice. No significant improvement in symptoms, but then again no significant improvement in inflammatory mediators either, so perhaps there's no surprise. But strawberries did decrease inflammation. Uh, let's see if they actually help in a randomized double-blind crossover trial, and dietary strawberries were indeed found to have a significant analgesic effect, causing a significant decrease in pain. Um, there are tumor necrosis factor inhibitor drugs on the market now available for the low, low cost of only about $40,000 a year. For that kind of money, you'd want some really juicy side effects, and they do not disappoint, like an especially fatal lymphoma. Uh, I think I'll stick with the strawberries. One of the reasons we suspected berries might help is that if you give people the equivalent of either a cup a day of blueberries or two cups a day of strawberries, and then drip their blood onto cells in a petri dish, you can see a significant blunting of inflammation compared to those who got placebo berries. And note that the attenuation of inflammation got better with time, so apparently the longer you eat berries, the better. Are there any other foods that have been tested in this way? 
Researchers in France harvested cartilage from knee replacement surgeries and then exposed them to concentrates of the blood of volunteers who took a whopping dose of a grapeseed and olive extract and saw a significant drop of induced inflammation. There haven't been any human studies putting grapeseeds to the test for arthritis, but an olive extract was shown to decrease pain and improve daily activities in osteoarthritis sufferers. So does this mean adding olive oil to one's diet may help? No, because they used freeze-dried olive vegetation water. Uh, that's basically what's left over after you extract the oil from the olives. It's all the water-soluble components. In other words, it's all the stuff that's in the olive that's missing from olive oil. If you give people actual olives, a dozen large green olives a day, you can see a before versus after drop in an inflammatory mediator. What if you look only at the oil? A systematic review and meta-analysis on the anti-inflammatory benefits of olive oil found there does not appear to be any. But wait, what about papers that ascribe remarkable anti-inflammatory effects to extra virgin olive oil? Here's their evidence on rodents. In people, extra virgin olive oil may be no better than butter when it comes to inflammation, and worse than even coconut oil. So, should we just stick to olives? Sadly, a dozen olives a day could take up nearly half your sodium limit for the entire day. When put to the test, extra virgin olive oil did not appear to help with fibromyalgia symptoms either, but it did work better than canola oil in alleviating symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any studies putting olive oil intake to the test for arthritis, but wait. <laughs> Why is this video entitled Extra Virgin Olive Oil for Arthritis? Because, are you ready for this? It appears to work topically. A double-blind, randomized clinical trial of topical virgin olive oil versus a gel containing an ibuprofen-type drug for osteoarthritis of the knee. Just a gram of oil, which would be like less than a quarter teaspoon, three times a day. So that would cost less than three cents a day, and it worked. Topical olive oil was significantly better than the drug in reducing pain. And the study only lasted a month, so maybe the olive oil would have continued to work better and better over time. What about the effectiveness of olive oil in controlling morning inflammatory pain of fingers and knees among women with rheumatoid arthritis? The researchers went all out, comparing the use of extra virgin olive oil to just rubbing on nothing to rubbing on that ibuprofen-type gel, and Evidently, the decrease in the disease activity score in the olive oil group beat out the others. Onions are potentially a good source of antioxidants, though interestingly the antioxidants are concentrated in the outer layers immediately under the papery peel. Unfortunately, most consumers discard these most nutrient-rich outermost layers, thus losing a valuable part. Here are some numbers. Look at that. More than 10 times more antioxidants in the outer layer of white onions compared to the core. Uh, you'll also note that yellow onions in general have more antioxidants than white, and red onions beat them both, based on three different antioxidant testing methods. That's why I always try to buy red. The red onions are indeed slightly better. Yellow or white onions are no slouches, containing considerable levels of antioxidant activity. So nutritious, sure, but are there any particular clinical benefits to onion consumption? There are grammatically challenged titles like this in the medical literature, purporting all sorts of miraculous benefits, but what do they base these claims on? Uh, for example, here's a review purporting to have evidence that testosterone in males are enhanced by onion. But the researchers were talking about studies like this on the effects of onion juice on testicular torsion in rats. Who cares what happens after a rat testicle is rotated 720 degrees counterclockwise, except, of course, the rat. You don't know what happens in people until you put human testes to the test, and onion extracts don't appear to work. OK, what about bone health? Evidently, older white women who consumed onions at least once a day had an overall bone density that was 5% greater than individuals who consumed onions no more than once a month. 5% uh, might not sound like a lot, but that improvement in bone density could potentially translate into decreasing the risk of hip fracture by more than 20% if, indeed, it was cause and effect. Daily administration of onion did cause a big bump in bone density. This opens the possibility for a low-cost, safe, and effective nutritional approach to osteoporosis. <gasps> 
You guessed it, in the rat. Another rodent study. Rats. But finally, here we go. Tremendous strides have been made in treating osteoporosis with drugs, but they have the potential for serious adverse side effects, so scientists have drawn their attention to natural remedies. So let's randomize people to drink onion juice, or placebo onion juice. <laughs> I don't know what sounds worse, sugary onion juice or fake sugary onion juice. And as if drinking onion juice wasn't bad enough, it was all for nothing. It didn't even work. What about the anti-allergy activities of shallots, and any therapeutic effects on helping allergic runny noses? Sixteen such patients were randomized equally into an antihistamine group, or a group that got antihistamines plus some capsules containing dried shallot powder. And it looked like the shallot group did better, but there was actually no statistically significant difference in total symptoms between the two groups, so another hashtag onion fail. There has to be something onions can do. What about testing the effects of fresh yellow onion consumption on breast cancer patients to try to decrease the toxic effects of a chemotherapy drug called doxorubicin? Unfortunately, no significant benefit was found on decreasing damage to the liver or heart, but here we go. Uh, finally, a clinical benefit to onions. The consumption of fresh yellow onion ameliorates the high blood sugars and insulin resistance in breast cancer patients during doxorubicin-based chemotherapy. Uh, doxorubicin isn't just toxic to the liver and heart. It may also contribute to insulin resistance. So let's do a randomized, triple-blind, controlled clinical trial randomizing patients to like a whole onion a day or a third of an onion a day. What happened? The high onion group experienced a significant decrease in blood sugars and insulin resistance compared to the low onion group. They went up in the low onion group, but down in the high onion group. So make onions your friend. What's the worst that can happen? A little onion breath and B.O.? Probably the least of your worries if you have cancer on chemotherapy.